chapter four, we're talking about applications of the derivative and the kinds of applications I talked about a couple of times ago dealt with finding where the high and low points of a function are. And since then, we've discovered that those points are somewhat described by the fact that the tangent line either doesn't exist, at it, in which case you have a corner, or the tangent line is horizontal. In other words, the slope is zero. So that led us to talk about so-called critical numbers for a function. Those are numbers where either the derivative doesn't exist or it's equal to zero. Your first group of problems had that as its main goal, given a function, find out where that uh, or those uh, critical numbers actually exist. Let's take a look at a couple more of those problems, more than we looked at last time. On page 152, we'll start out with number 18. That's a V, I suppose. T of V is 4V plus 1 times, is it the square root of V squared minus 16? Certainly not a simple function. It's not a polynomial. The square root makes things uh, undesirable in terms of graphing. But I think what I should point out now is that since this is a square root, really the, the values that we're interested in are not all possible values of v, but only v's that would make sense in terms of a non-negative value inside the square root. In other words, v squared minus 16 would have to be non-negative, or v in absolute value has to be greater than or equal to 4. Otherwise, the, the function is not defined. So this, then, is the domain of t. And kind of stick that in the back of your mind, because in some of these problems, it comes back and haunts you. The fact that uh, you look in the back of the book for an answer, I guess this one doesn't have one, but if you were to look in the back for an answer, you might not see as many as you perhaps you thought should be there. And we'll see why here shortly. So continuing on, finding where the derivative is zero or doesn't exist, we need to take the derivative of the right-hand side. I'm going to work in fractional powers and deal with that second term as a one-half power, need to take the derivative of that product. Again, there's some question, I guess, in some minds. What do you do first to take that derivative? Well, first you compute what's inside the parentheses, then take the square root over here, and then finally you multiply. So for those that wonder what goes on first in terms of derivatives, you have to worry about a product rule. In the last quiz, a few of you missed that idea. If you've got products of functions, well, you've got to take that product rule first in this case. So this would be the derivative of the first, which is just 4, times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second, with a half power there. That gives us 1 half. v squared minus 16 to the minus 1 half. Derivative of v squared minus 16 would be a 2v. So product rule, derivative of the first times the second plus the first derivative of that fractional power in the second term looks something like that. Now, that's a, if I haven't made a mistake, that's a good enough answer for taking the derivative. No primes left over. But uh, we've got to find out where this function is 0 or where it doesn't even exist in the first place. Perhaps the thing to do is go back to square roots. I don't know that that's the best thing for everyone, but the square roots, I think, are a little bit more indicative of, I can cancel two here as well, a little bit more indicative of what you want to do next. Perhaps it's just me, but positive and negative fractional powers are rather hard to see what to, what to do with. But now if you look at this, You might imagine that you want to put over a common denominator. Okay. So to do that, we'll multiply the left term by that square root. And what we'll have is 4 times v squared minus 16 plus 
right-hand side, we multiplied out 4v squared plus v. So there is t prime of v. Well, I can certainly simplify it, but let's just go over here and copy it again and, and simplify and take a look at it. t prime of v, then, is we have 8v squared plus v looks like a minus 64 all over radical v squared minus 60. Get 8v squared plus the v minus 4 times 16 or 64. Okay, so the first question is, at least in my mind, where is this thing zero? T prime equals zero. That would be equivalent to when the numerator is zero. And there you have a simple quadratic. Perhaps it can be factored. I don't know that it can be. We ought to at least check to see if it's factorable in the first place. The book talks about a discriminant. What that means is if you tried to apply the quadratic rule, would you be successful? And it looks like the answer is yes, because b squared, b being the coefficient of v here, b squared minus 4ac is a positive number inside the radical. So the discriminant, that positive number, being positive means that you will have two real roots out of all of that. And I don't propose to go on and compute that. Maybe it's simple. I don't know. But anyway, these are the two critical values, or critical numbers, I should say, corresponding to where t prime is 0. Critical number is either where t prime is 0 at those two numbers or where t prime doesn't exist because of whatever. <coughs> I'd say someone would then jump into the problem and say, looks like uh, t prime doesn't exist at v squared minus 16 equals 0. Or in fact, if it's negative, gee, it looks like there are an infinite number of critical numbers if you look at places where t prime doesn't exist. This is where you almost have to be a lawyer and read that book super carefully. It says a critical number is where the derivative is 0 or at a point in the domain of the function where the derivative does not exist. That little phrase, in the domain of the function, then says that even though you know, it looked OK to begin with, the domain of t, in fact, uh, excluded numbers between minus and plus 4. And therefore, it has nothing to do with critical numbers over here when you look at t prime. Those numbers were not even under consideration because we're only looking at those critical numbers that are, in fact, within the domain of t. So just because v greater than absolute, or absolute v greater than 4 looks bad over here does not mean it's a critical number because they were ruled out originally as being outside the domain of the original function. So it seems to me that the only answers that you would come up with, if you compute them out, would be these two critical numbers corresponding to where the, the tangent is horizontal. That's not to say that this is the most common situation. Let me give you a quick example. Uh, f of x equals x to the 1 third. This is true for all x. But f prime of x, if you check it out, is 1 over 3x to the 2 thirds. And that's only when x is not 0. In other words, the domain of f has been decreased by one point, x equals 0. And this would be a critical number, even though, you know, well, I'm, I'm, it's not that close to this example. But I'm trying to show you that you might start out with a complicated problem and lose some points after taking derivatives which turn out to be the critical numbers that you're after. But in this problem over here, uh, the, the things that look bad for the derivative were already bad for the function to start with, and they're not even under consideration anymore.
Okay, so be worried about square roots and cube roots and things like that. They can often cause a little bit of a problem if you're not careful. Next problem someone wanted to see was 21. That's sine squared t minus cosine t. Once again, find the critical numbers. Good enough answer, but to find zeros, probably the thing you'll want to do is factor. Okay, and if you want this to be equal to zero, that would imply either the sine of zero or 2 cosine t plus 1 is 0. And that's why you like to factor. It allows you to identify zeros by what the individual factors look like. Now, sine t is 0 at any multiple of pi. So probably, in the back of the book, you'll see something like n pi. n to be thought of as any integer positive, negative, or zero. You know, the, the first, the first uh, thing you'll think about is that this is t equals zero, but we're interested in any value of t. I gave you a reason about that maybe last time. You might have some kind of uh, spring that does some kind of non-simple harmonic motion. And perhaps the distance the spring is away from equilibrium would be given by our function f of t as time goes on. And so we're not just interested at what happens at t equals zero, but maybe past uh, 20 seconds, what's happening to the spring at that particular time. So we need to identify all possible zeros of the derivative, all possible critical values. And over here, what we need is cosine t to be negative a half. Okay, that suggests two basic angles. T is, I think it's 2 pi over 3, or T equals 5 pi over 3, if I've done my mental arithmetic properly. Those are the second and third quadrant angles that give you a negative 1 half for the cosine. But we can also allow any even multiple of pi be added on. Not any multiple, because if we just added pi onto this angle, you'd get a positive one-half for the cosine. The difference is that over here, I'm kind of saying it's plus or minus zero. It doesn't make any difference. And so you get kind of twice as many over here as you do for each one of these individually over here. And that's not a, a good mathematical explanation. But you do have to be careful that you don't add on just multiples of pi but even multiples of pi. And those can be either positive or negative, or zero, of course. So looking in the back of the book, one hopes that you'll see actually an infinite number of critical numbers, these being the ones of interest perhaps in the zero to two pi area, but maybe you want to worry about two pi to four pi or some large number, in fact. So you need to identify those. Any more questions? Mr. Petrov. On, on the same page. Number three and number 15 on that page. OK, 15, was it? OK. Number three says find absolute maximum minimum of f on the indicated closed interval. Well, where do absolute maxima and minima occur? Start out with that question. 
Okay. Maximum minima tend to occur on closed intervals for continuous functions, either at the endpoints or where the first derivative is zero or where the first derivative doesn't exist. That's what these kinds of questions are about. So this problem, f of x, was it 1 minus x to the 2 thirds? And the interval for those negative 1 to 8, if I remember right. Okay. There's a closed interval. And uh, I haven't used this notation too much in class. It's just what your book always uses, in fact. So to refresh your memory, closed interval means you include the endpoints. All x is between minus 1 and plus 8 inclusive. How about this? Is this a continuous function? Is it smooth? Does it have any breaks in it? Well, I guess the only question is, is x to the 2 thirds a smooth function? For one reason or another, you can check back in your section on continuity where it talks about powers of continuous functions are continuous as long as everything's defined pretty well. So that may cause some question, but I think we're okay there. And so really get into the problem, I think you ought to say, gee, if it's continuous on a closed interval, we do know that it has an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. So the question is well posed to start with. Well, what we're supposed to do is, as I just said, look for the critical numbers, fill in that list, then check the values at the endpoints and just compare them all. Okay, so for the critical numbers, what we'll do is try to see what the derivative looks like. In this case, it'll be a minus 2 thirds x to the minus 1 third. Oh, pardon me, a plus because of the original negative sign here. No, it is negative. Right the first time. f prime of x is a negative 2 thirds x to the minus 1 third. Or maybe make it look a little bit better negative 2 over 3 cube root of x, or whatever fashion you prefer, where is that equal to 0? Where is negative 2 over cube root of x times 3 equal to 0? Never. Never happens. So maybe I can understand your question. Your answer when I asked you was, well, let's check where the derivative is 0. Turns out it isn't 0 anywhere. And that's why uh, we have to look at other things. The other kinds of critical numbers are where the derivative doesn't exist. Where doesn't it exist, obviously? At x equals 0. So there is a critical number. Okay? And what is f at that critical number? It's equal to 1. So there's a number at the one and only critical number at the endpoints of the interval. f at minus 1 is 0. f at 8, my negative 3 is it? OK. So there are the endpoint values. And let me refresh your memories once again. The theorem says it does have absolute maxima. It does have absolute minima, at least one of each. They will occur either at the endpoints or at a critical number. So what you're looking at are all the possibilities. Now it's easy. It's just like picking bananas at the store. That's obviously the absolute minimum. There's only one. And that's obviously the absolute maximum. I think if you draw this, I'm kind of going out on a limb because, for one thing, we're not supposed to know how to do this yet. But I think if you draw this, and I'm not going to be able to do it at all to scale too well, it looks like this. Or <laughs> the other way around. Let me look. Plus, it's probably the other way around. But anyway, I think it, whatever it looks like, what we've discovered is that there's that sharp corner there. 
And so it was foolish of us to just set the derivative equal to zero and hope to find the maximum because, in fact, the maximum exists where the derivative doesn't exist. And our minimum is over here at x equals 8. Okay. Sir, could it cross the uh, x-axis? Is it continuous there at the x-axis? Must, because it says it's 1 at 0 and it's negative 3 at 8, and you've just said it's continuous, so it's got to cross somewhere. And obviously, it crosses at 1. Maybe it crosses again. Uh, I won't put my entire professional reputation on that picture because I've got some doubts about it, but I think that's, for the interesting part, I think that's the problem right here. Okay. So that's uh, a good demonstration, I think, of that theorem. It says you've got to look not only at where the derivative is zero, but you've got to look at where it doesn't exist or maybe even the endpoints. Problem 15, let's see what was trouble with that one. Z squared minus 16? Sounds familiar. This may be the same difficulty we just had with the, the previous problem. I'm not sure. But for one thing, this is only defined when Z, again, is strictly greater than 4 in absolute value. Or greater than or equal to 4, pardon me. You can also throw that in. Anything less gives you a negative square root. So that's the domain. And if we look for critical numbers, they would have to be within that domain. So if you take the derivative, let's see, we'll get, uh, I think, z over square root of z squared minus 16, doing that a little quickly, but just to get through the problem. You would say, gee, that's equal to 0 at z equals 0, obvious. So there's a critical number. Uh, doesn't exist. for uh, z less than or equal to 4 in absolute value. It does not exist if z is less than or equal to because you might be dividing by 0. Now, the original domain was greater than or equal to 4. Let's see if I can get this right now. That means that when z is plus or minus 4, you've got points where the derivative does not exist, but the function was well-defined to begin with. Now, these are. I think this is going to be a problem of quibbling with the author. These are endpoints of the domain. Whether or not you still want to call those critical numbers, I'm not sure. You have to write a letter to. Yeah, that's, that's the answer. OK. I'm not, uh, you know, if I didn't have the answer in the back, I guess, I wouldn't know. You can't have z equals 0, though, yeah. can you? Because that's outside of the Right. Yeah. You're right, exactly. That's something I missed. Uh, so this was not a critical number because it didn't exist in the original domain. Okay, I'm, I missed that one. And here, I would be, I don't know, I'm not, I, I lean both ways, in fact, as to whether or not I call these critical numbers, because they really are endpoints of the domain. And whether that's really a critical number, I'm not too sure. But at any rate, we've come up with three things we ought to look at. And I would rather take that approach. Don't throw things away unless you're absolutely certain we shouldn't be looking at them. And I know in the book, he makes real care about saying that is not a critical number, obviously because it's not in the, the original domain. But if you throw that in on a quiz or a test, I'm not going to take anything off. You found points of interest, and we ought to look at them some more. I think those, those should be the criteria of, of checking these functions out. That's right. I was going to say something about 23. Thanks. And that was, what is it, sine? I think the first thing I'd do, I don't know if this is what the author had in mind, was change this by the double angle formula. It's kind of hard to deal with functions of two kinds of angles. And I realize that's something of a cop-out. Now it looks almost like the one we did before, number 21. But I think maybe that's certainly a good way to attack the problem. Again, you have to use product rule here. But once again, when you take the derivative, factor as best you can. And then you're still stuck with finding 
when certain trig functions equal certain numbers, and we hope they're famous numbers so you can basically write those down. Okay, I think the problem looking at it from my point of view is that if you went ahead with the problem as it sits, There isn't a whole lot you can do with 2 cosine 2 theta minus 2 sine theta yet. If you did do it that way, I might suggest a double angle formula for cosine of 2 theta, which I think is uh, for what we want 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. And now you've got a quadratic and sine. I would suspect that you'd have the same thing if you went at it this way as well. So at some point, you've got to get it in terms of the same angle and uh, one hopes in terms of the same trig function so you can do some factorization or at least the factorization would be simple. Okay, once again, I don't think the calculus was tough. It really gets down to the nitty gritty about your algebraic techniques and domains of functions. It goes back to the first couple of days of class. Let's try something new. Not really. We just uh, supposedly finished up section 4.1. We've done a lot of problems there, so let's say I think we ought to finish up 4.1. The next logical place in the book to go would be actually 4.3. If I get my numbers right. Yep. It's a continuation of the topics we've just talked about here. What do you do with the critical numbers once you have them? So far, in a lot of the problems, you might have a half a dozen critical numbers, but you're not sure whether they're maxima or minima or neither, for that matter. So the next question would be, well, how can you identify what's going on at these critical numbers? Okay, that's in 4.3. Section 4.2, they've shoehorned in a topic which seems totally uh, unrelated to what we're doing, and I will admit doesn't look very applicable sitting in this chapter on applications of derivatives. But there it is, and there is a reason for it, and we'll see what that is shortly. So the section 4.2 starts out with something perhaps along these lines. Let's try it with a picture first. Here's a function that starts at f of a and ends up over here somewhere at f of b. Okay, so those are two points on the function. And let's just think of it as traveling around on the plane as if you were a little bug. And there's the easy way to get from one point to the other. That's supposed to be a straight line. That's the easy way. And then there's the interesting way, I suppose. We could do things like that, just kind of wander around. We're limiting yourselves to uh, functions, so it'd have to look something like that. And the, the main thrust of the entire section is the following, that along this path, at some point, there is a tangent to the curve at point C, where the slope is equal to Let's call it the secant slope. <coughs> okay, once again, you've got two points on the curve at x equals a and x equals b. You've got the secant line between those two points. And all this chapter is about, this section I should say, is that there is at least one number c such that the tangent to the curve at c parallels the secant line, or the slopes are equal. Well, I can see a lot of people nodding their heads because, sure, that's just the way it looks. Okay. Now, you've got to worry about some things, and that's what I want to talk about next. These are the bad examples. 
first one, how about f of x, which is 1 over x squared. A is minus 1, B is plus 1. If you plug in, f of A is uh, equal to 1, and so is f of B. So there's no difference in the altitudes when you go from A to B. That means the secant slope is 0. Now over here, the two points have the same y coordinates, so the secant slope is 0. But if you look at f prime of x, that's the derivative of x to the minus 2, which is minus 2x to the minus 3. If you look at that, then the tangent slope I'm looking at over in that picture would be f prime of c, which was a minus 2 over c cubed. Okay, and the claim is that the tangent slope should equal the secant slope for some number between a and b. Now, where is this ever going to be satisfied between a and b? Yeah. Never. Never that, ever, anywhere. It's not possible. So the example here says, gee, it seems to be a case, at least, where that uh, parallel tangent to secant doesn't hold. Of course, the picture is that the secant is horizontal, and so we're looking for a horizontal tangent. And there doesn't seem to be any. So obviously, this picture doesn't fit that situation. Okay, what's wrong with this situation over here? What makes this bad? Okay, slope of the tangent is undefined at what number? Zero. zero. And if you go back even further, the function wasn't even defined at zero. So I guess what your book would say is that zero is not a critical number because it wasn't even uh, an element in your domain of your function. Now, I could define this function to be something else at zero. But the, the problem here, when you get down and look at it, is that f is not continuous. The function f is not continuous. And that turns out to be what, uh, I guess, what we can claim is what's bad about this particular function. If you were to graph it, and we graphed something like it last time, I believe, you'll find that the f of x looks like this. It has what we'll call a vertical asymptote at the origin. And so when I was doing the secant line, unfortunately I'm using the same colors, that was this horizontal line right here. And you can see from the curve there's never a tangent that's parallel to it. But the problem is the function has a bad break at the origin. It's not continuous. So that seems to be something we ought to at least impose on the function to get this result. Well, there's another bad example we ought to look at first. This one even looks bad because we've had problems with it before. F this time will be the absolute value of x. Once again, f of a is f of b equals 1. So the secant slope is 0. How about f prime of x? Uh, turns out it's either plus or minus 1. I'm leaving out some details, but just take my word for it. So f prime of c, again, is never equal to 0. In other words, the tangent slope, just like in example 1, the tangent slope is never equal to the secant slope. If the slopes aren't equal, then not, the lines aren't parallel. Well, I've avoided the pitfalls in this one. Did anyone spy what the problem was? Let me draw you a better picture this time. Here we are. Here's f at minus 1. And here's f at plus 1. So here was your horizontal secant line. 
But the function itself, you should recognize it, is this thing. And I'm taking a real gamble here. Is it continuous? The function. Is the function, function is continuous? continuous? OK, function, function is continuous. No breaks, no bad wiggles. What's wrong? Horizontal, uh, horizontal slope. Has no horizontal slope because no, no slope. Okay. This thing has problems at the origin in the sense that f prime does not exist at x equals 0. So this thing had problems because of a uh, problem with differentiability. f prime does not exist on minus 1 less than x less than plus 1, at least once. It doesn't exist throughout the interval. Uh, maybe that's the better word to use, throughout. F prime, of it, F prime does not exist throughout the interval. OK, so that pretty much keys us into what's bad about these two. We've got problems with continuity. We've got problems with differentiability. But that turns out to be the only two problems you need to worry about if you want to complete the discussion in this section. So let's come back here and, and tell you what happens. Statement something like this. If f is continuous, on the closed interval, between a and b. OK, there's the continuity part. And if f prime exists on the open interval, at least, Then there will be some C between A and B so that, let's see if I can get it down here, F prime at C will be, now that's the, the tangent slope. What I need is a secant slope on the right-hand side. OK, let's see how that looks. Let's come back to our picture. Of course, a secant is a straight line. As a straight line, its slope would be rise over run. And the run's easy. That's b minus a. And the rise is pretty easy also. That's f of b minus f of a. So the uh, slope I seek on the right-hand side, then, would be rise over the run. And that's pretty much the statement of the theorem that we're looking for in this particular section. This is called the mean value theorem. And perhaps after this section, you won't think you're seeing it very much, but it's a little bit like the chain rule. It's uh, always there. You just may not know it by name. I'm, I won't say it's as ubiquitous as the chain rule. There are a lot of situations where you'll be doing some fairly important, fairly tough mathematics, even up through Calc 3. And if you look at the fine print closely for the proofs of whatever those things you're dealing with are, very often they're saying, by the mean value theorem, we can show that such and such is true. OK, so many proofs will contain the mean value theorem as one of the important ingredients. Well, why is it in this particular area in this book? Not because it's uh, too applicable, as I said before. I wouldn't consider it itself an application. But for one thing, as I said, you'll find that it's a, uh, an ingredient in proofs. For another, you can see here where that uh, connection might be. We are specifying something about the derivative. And so, in fact, we'll find out a little bit later in the next section, in 4.3, that one of the basic theorems there is just built right on top of a mean value theorem application.
We talk about monotonicity of functions. We're talking about something about its derivative. It turns out that the mean value theorem is just the thing to use. Well, before we get into that, I think uh, I should warn you that there are problems in this section, and they're not really applicable problems, quote unquote. It turns out that you're looking at problems that just want you to make sure you know what's going on with the mean value theorem, what it does say, and what it does not say. The first couple of problems will be like these that I had up here, bad examples. They'll say, here's a function, here's a closed interval, the mean value theorem doesn't work, why? Well, it should be obvious. If it doesn't work, then one or both of these have to fail. It's just up to you to figure out which one it is, if it's not both, in fact. The other kinds of problems you have, again, are rather busy work problems. They will give you a specific interval. They'll give you a specific function, which satisfies all the criteria here. And then they will say, yes, the mean value theorem guarantees a C, but you tell me which one really works. You be specific about what C has to be. So let me give you a quick rundown on that. This is probably not as easy as some of yours are, but it's the same idea. Take a cube, cubic polynomial. Let's take as our interval minus 1 to 2. And what you're supposed to do is produce a C that does the job. Now, let's, let's find out first what f of a is. a is, uh, what, minus 1 plus 1, plus 1, looks like a plus 1. f at b is 8, minus 2 is 6, plus 1 is 7. Although your problems don't really require a picture, I'd suggest you put as much down as you can. And right now we say we know the functions about here, and we know the functions about up here. And Right now, in fact, without getting too bogged down in algebra, I can do the secant line part. Obviously, the run in this question is three units, and the rise is from one to seven, so that'd be six. So the slope of this thing is two. Now, for those that don't draw pictures, what will happen is that you'll come over here and say, well, f of b minus f of a. They asked me to compute this, so I'll go ahead and do it is 7 minus 1 over 2 minus a minus 1, and that's 6 over 3, that's 2. Okay, you get numbers. I hope you appreciate where they come from and what they refer to. That's the slope of the secant line. Now, the real thrust of the problem, if there is any, is that you're supposed to say, well, where is 2 equal to f prime of c? What c does the job? In this case, f prime of c is going to be 3c squared minus 1. If you solve this, you'll see that c has to be plus or minus 1. Again, if uh, the problem is nitpicking, the author will say the answer is plus 1 because minus 1 is not, and I didn't even write it out properly, I guess, but it's not strictly between a and b. The C in question should be strictly between A and B. And this one happens to have one that works at the left-hand endpoint and one at the right. If you draw this curve out, I think you'll find something that looks like this. And there is that tangent that's parallel that we're looking for. I only have a, a few seconds left. What we're going to talk about in the next section, next time, is how did I come up with that curve? How did I know what it looked like? And that's one of the applications of derivatives that we'll get into fairly shortly. Okay. Be sure to do your homework on Rolle's theorem and the mean value theorem. We'll come back and talk about these problems next time.